This is a series of presentations, although each presentation can be viewed independently. The focus is understanding the complexity of the dorsal apparatus. There are many parts and pieces to the dorsal apparatus that move in concert, and our goal in this video course is to delve into this, hopefully in greater depth than you've done previously. This is exquisite anatomy, never as apparent in real presentation as it is in the drawings of um, biomedical artists. But let's see what we can tease out. The single most important thing to remember as we go through this information is that we are endeavoring to break this down into small parts and pieces. But the anatomy is highly variable, and you need not to focus on each individual piece of information, but how the information uh, comes together to allow the finger to move. I think this will become clearer as we move along. Let's start with some overview concepts that are valuable. Now we're thinking about how the human finger moves. As we know, the whole flexor muscle tendon unit has much greater tension than anything on the extensor surface. And part of what happens is the tone that creates the flexor tone counteracts the extension power so that we don't hyperextend the MP joint. Keep in mind, an individual with, for example, ulnar palsy will hyperextend the MP joints of the ring and little fingers because the absence of the interossei and in this circumstance also the lumbricals of these fingers give no counterbalance during finger extension. It's also very important as we conceptualize this information to keep in mind that muscles even at rest, have a passive viscoelastic quality to them. There is a passive force here because the resting tissue um, has tone, as we know. So even though there's not a specific active muscle contraction, there may indeed be passive participation of that muscle providing some balance or in some way passively affecting movement. This unfortunately adds another layer of complexity to understanding this, but it also helps to explain many concepts. Extension of the human finger is a complex interaction of multiple fibers. We spoke about this in the first um, course in this series where the fibers move in relationship to one another. Flexion, however, we would assume is much simpler because we have one flexor tendon, muscle tendon unit from origin to insertion that drives finger flexion. Flexors are also, in addition to being very strong, they're very mechanically efficient because of the pulley system within the finger. But what happens during extension is we have a combination of the extrinsic, meaning the extensor digitorum communis, and the intrinsic, which is the lumbrical and interosseous muscles. During flexion, we might think it's purely extrinsic, but the ability to flex the finger is mediated, or if you will, controlled or modulated by the intrinsic muscles in the dorsal apparatus. So flexion is not an isolated event when just the flexor muscle tendon units are moving. I'd like to introduce this schematic drawing, which you will see repeatedly throughout this and other presentations. You will see uh, a fairly accurate representation of the bones, but these shapes represent the various muscle influences.
Consistent throughout this presentation, we will use red to represent the extensor digitorum communis influence, blue to represent the interosseous muscles, and green to represent the lumbrical, while we will use a silver or gray color to represent the extrinsic flexors. This way, when you're looking at this schematic drawing, you can appreciate which muscle is having the influence. This is oversimplistic. This is not accurate mechanically. But what it allows us to do is to conceptualize. Mm -hmm.